dive into your word. Open our eyes and our hearts to all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well, have you ever, guys, ever gotten a package with just a pesky seal on it? I, you know, I don't have good fingernails, and so I'll sit and I'll try to scratch it and I'll work at it from a couple of different angles and I'll struggle with it until finally I just get up and go get a knife or scissors to open it, right? Because, you know, seals are meant to stop us from opening something easily and protect what's inside, right? Well, in this chapter of 6 of Revelation, the lamb very easily opens the seal and he puts into effect the flow of history and begins the judgment of God. So our central idea today is that the wrath of God is real. But God's sealed servants stand strong. That is really fun to say. Sealed servants stand strong. Sealed servants stand strong. I like it. So just, just to review, you know, the title of our book that we're studying is The Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The revealing, the unveiling, the lifting of the lid of what Jesus wants us to see. And in chapter 4, it was a door was opened in heaven and we saw the throne and someone sitting on the throne. In chapter 5, we saw this scroll in the right hand of God. And no one was worthy to open that scroll, remember? And John thought he was going to see a lion ready to open the scroll. And instead, he, he saw a lamb that was slain. And only he was worthy to open the seal. Well, Revelation 6 is where a lot of people stop reading Revelation. <laughs> So good job, good job to all you guys. We are going forward. We are, we are plunging into it. So here's our, um, our outline for today. Six seals and the worship of the multitudes. We'll start out looking at the first five seals in 6, 1 to 11, and then the sixth seal in 12 to 17, and then chapter 7 is God's people are sealed and the multitudes worshiped. And through it all, we'll see the wrath of God is real, but God's sealed servants stand strong. Excellent. Okay, so let's dive in. Verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. What we're seeing is that that word come can also be translated go forth. So this lamb opens the seal, and one of the creatures says, go forth. And first what comes out, we have these four horsemen. And there are some crazy illustrations online. But it's, it's kind of fun to see some of the things depicted, the different things that they're holding and stuff. Although it looks a little like a Halloween poster, but it... it Remember, these are all symbols of, of something deep. And this first horseman has, has taken a lot of ink. A lot of people have written about this first horseman. Who is he? Uh, many think he could be Christ himself riding a white horse with a crown. I kind of think that's what the person who drew this picture thinks, yeah. <laughs> is that he's wearing a crown coming to conquer. Many also feel... However, that this first horseman is the Antichrist himself, that he's imitating Christ on a white horse, that he's wearing a crown and coming to conquer. And you know, this, this idea works if these horsemen, these four horsemen of Revelation 6, are connected with the 70th week of Daniel. And I can say something crazy like that to you guys because we just study Daniel. So maybe you remember, Trisha taught Daniel 9 where we learned about the 70 weeks and that that last week of seven or seven years had not had any initial fulfillment. And Daniel told us in Daniel 9 that the start of that future seven years was going to start with an evil ruler prophesying and, and coming to conquer. So perhaps that first horseman is the Antichrist. If we put ourselves into the shoes of these first century readers who would have gotten this letter, 
they very much could have felt all of this was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. The Emperor Nero came in initiating a war against the Jews in AD 66, and in AD 70, the whole temple in Jerusalem was all gone. They could have felt surely they were in that time of great tribulation. The second horse we saw was red, was given a great sword, and took peace from the earth. The first horseman had a bow, but now it's escalating to a sword. The battle's closer. The bloodshed is more terrible. The red is the symbol of war and violence. And unfortunately, it's not hard for us to imagine that, right? Our modern age is marked by war and conflict. Even just since World War II, there have been more than 150 wars of some kind in the world. And at any given time, there could be some three dozen armed conflicts taking place right now. So that second horseman was red. The third horseman in verses 5 and 6 is black. And he held scales. And he brought famine and destruction. And he talks about the price of food. And if you study this a little bit, these prices were about 12 times higher than normal. That is inflation. That's famine. And it means that it would cost a whole day's wages just to buy a loaf of bread, not even to feed your family. It was a time of great deprivation. And often, when violence and wars happen, what follows next? We have food shortage leading to hunger and famine. And you know, thinking of a future tribulation period, it isn't that tough when we look at the food hoarding that we've just lived through. And even now, the shortages, you go to the store sometimes and the shelf is just empty and I say, what are we, what is going on? It's not that hard to imagine. And then understanding the world's precarious ecological balance it wouldn't take much to plunge many into this kind of scarcity. All right, verses 7 and 8, we have the fourth horse, the pale rider named Death with Hades, and given authority to kill with the sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. It's an awful image of death riding through the earth. And even just in our 20th century, we have seen incredible death and ethnic cleansing. Our century started out in 1915 with 1.5 million Armenians being killed. Six million Jews were killed in World War II. Mao Zedong slaughtered Chinese people. And then even as recent as our 1990s, there was the genocide in Rwanda. All this chaos, all this death. But even in this devastation of these four horsemen, we're going to see that God is still in control. Chaos and violence are not signs that the Lamb isn't on his throne. It's just a sign that judgment has come. And we're going to see this more in the coming weeks. Note the first horseman. It says that he had a crown, but that crown was given to him. Who is it given to him by? The lamb. God is in control. He can only operate if given permission. The fourth horseman, the power was given to them over a fourth of the earth. Though all hell breaks loose on earth, God is very much control in control, and he still holds that scroll in his right hand, and the lamb opens the seals. I struggle with this. Do you guys really believe that God is in control, because he is, of COVID. Is God in control of COVID, of climate change, of cancer, of disease? You know, I thought, I just wanted us just to sit for a minute and just think about, if you struggle with that, what would that feel like just to believe that God is in control? When I think of all the neurons and the protons circulating in every cell of my body that's not imploded. God is in control of even that on the microscopic level. God is in control of the cells of my body. He's turning the earth so that we can have night and day. We can rest in, even in the face of these scary things that we're reading about, that God is ultimately in control and nothing happens without his permission. 
So verses 9 to 10, he opens the fifth seal, and under the altar were the souls of those who'd been slain for the word of God, for the witness they'd borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign and Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Someone said this morning, that's a good question. How long, right? How long? And, you know, some say that these are those saved during a specific seven-year tribulation period. But it may be all those who have paid the ultimate price for Jesus. And in some ways, their prayer almost sounds a little self-serving, doesn't it? Um, Appealing for justice and vengeance. But, you know, when God's people are persecuted... He will set it right. And it isn't wrong for God's people to ask him to do what he has promised, right? He has promised to make all things right. So they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers could be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So they were given a white robe. Who remembers what white white robe stands for? Right, and righteousness, right? The righteousness that we get from God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to continue to see these white robes given to those servants of God in heaven. And even though the wrath of God is real, God's sealed servants are standing strong in the face of it. Even in the face of the sixth seal. And this was where it got even more scary. He opened the sixth seal and I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. Every mountain and island removed from its place. It's like the whole earth is imploding on itself, right? It's terrifying. And, you know, Jesus spoke in a very similar way about all this. In Matthew 24, verse 7, he says, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And then verse 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall. Wrath from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. It's not hard to imagine our beautiful planet being destroyed. You know, it might be natural disasters that we've witnessed. Earthquakes, tsunamis, hello, tsunamis, fires, volcanoes, all of these things. Not even to mention the nuclear arsenal that nations all over the world are building up. And I read a statistic that just sent me into the shivers that today one nuclear sub holds more explosives than every bomb exploded in World War II. More than Hiroshima, more than Nagasaki, more than all the bombs. The the nuclear arsenal is a very real way that our planet could be destroyed. It's a great The sixth seal is the great and awesome day of the Lord. And the kings and the powerful, the rich and the poor, they call to the mountains, fall on us, hide us from the face of the Lamb, seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come. And who can stand? It's interesting that what sinners dread most isn't death, but it's it's the wrath of the Lamb. And wouldn't it have been cool if, as the rocks were falling, they were, they were calling out instead, save us, God, we repent, have mercy on us, save us. We don't see that. And, you know, we wonder how people can continue to reject God, even in the face of great calamity. But sadly, people who reject God stubbornly continue, even in the face of of utter destruction, and we're going to see more of that next week. But in the face of all of this, no wonder, verse 17 says, who is able to stand, right? Well, we're going to see the answer 
is in chapter 7, verse 3. And who is able to stand? God's sealed servants. And we're going to have to wait till chapter 8 next week to open that seventh seal. He, there was kind of a, they left us dangling. What is that seventh seal? But the first six seals, I, this is a little, put on your little student hat for a minute, because I want to tell you guys a little bit about the structure of our book going forward, because I think it will give us a good framework for understanding. The first six seals are a summary of the judgments distributed over the whole book, a brief summary that will occur in the day of the Lord right up to his return in chapter 19. Okay, so I, I put it up here like this, that the, the events aren't all consecutive. And sometimes God even interjects an interlude, as we're going to see. So there's three sets of events that we're going to be studying in the coming weeks. There's seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls of wrath. Now with each of these, this is so cool, the first four of each of those, the four seals, four trumpets, four bowls, all are visible on earth. And then the last three are in the spiritual realm. So like today we had the first four horsemen, then we had the martyrs under the throne, we had the destruction. And these these events all fit inside one another. So we're going to see that during the, within the seventh seal, the seven trumpets are opened. And then during the seventh trumpet, as, judge, as Christ's coming is drawing near, all the seven bowls are poured out. So they're all kind of intertwined with each other. So we'll hold on to that while we read it because it helps us to... to have a place to hang all these events and all these thoughts in our minds. So I just thought that was fascinating. So as I said, throughout Revelation, God gives John and us breaks. He gives us interludes from these really scary visions. And chapter 7 is one of these breaks. And this interlude might be the most comforting of all the visions in the last book of the Bible. You know, maybe as John was sitting on that pile of rocks on the island of Patmos, maybe this was super comforting to him as he heard about the sealing of the servants of God in chapter 7. It says, After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. And then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we've sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So it's possible that this, this vision, chapter 7, the activity actually occurred before chapter 6. I don't want to blow your mind. We're like in the matrix here a little bit. But you know how it says, do not harm the earth or the sea until the believers are sealed. So none of that destruction of the seals could happen until the believers are sealed. So we have to say, what does it mean to be sealed? I love that we got to look at some of those verses in our homework. A seal protects Jesus' servants from the ultimate consequences of the breaking of the seals and the trumpets and the bowls. It enables them to respond in faith to the incredible trial they're facing. And we saw that Paul used this word sealed three times. And he talked about the seal of the living God is what? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit enables us not to compromise when pressure intensifies. And I was thinking more about these seals and the word seals. Chapter 6 is opening seals on the scroll. And then chapter 7 speaks about the same thing as seal, but now the seals on we who believe. So think of this, that the Lamb who has authority to open the seals on the scroll is the same lamb who puts the seal, not on a scroll, but on us. 
And just like no one could open that sealed scroll except the Lamb, we are protected for eternity by God's seal. And I just have to ask you guys that are here, you guys are watching online, are you sealed with the Holy Spirit? You know, if you say you're a follower of Jesus and not a lot has changed in your life, have a conversation with Jesus. Get on your knees and just tell him, I'm sorry for the ways that I have not followed your laws, the way of the Lamb, like we spoke last week. Surrender to him. Invite the Holy Spirit. Remember we read that Jesus was knocking on the door. In the same way, invite the Holy Spirit to dwell in you and seal you for the day ahead. Because when we're sealed, nothing can keep us from God. And if this passage, that studying all this caused you to fear, I know it did me, current world events, I just have to turn it off. I can get so fearful. But I wanted to share an exercise that uh, a Bible teacher that I love shared. And she said, if there's a continued fear that dogs you, losing a spouse, a fear of disease, a fear of nuclear war, take some time and just go there with Jesus. Not every day, but sit with that. Say, Jesus, I need to face this fear. And so for me this week, it was nuclear war as I read about all these statistics. I thought, okay, Jesus, you're with me. A nuclear bomb falls on Los Angeles. Somehow I survive. I'm in my home. Maybe I have a home. Maybe I'm in the backyard. I'm alive. Jesus is still with me. He is still giving me strength. I can still love and serve the people around me. And I still have the hope of heaven, of eternity with him. And that kind of removes the sting a little bit. That fear of the unknown. Whatever we fear, we can know that Jesus is going to walk through that with us. And that if we're sealed in him, nothing can take us from his hands. And I want to read, I want to read with you guys this paraphrase of Romans 8, 38 and 39. It says, so now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced. Are you guys convinced? I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, dark rulers in the heavens. There's nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. There's no power above or beneath us. No power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. The wrath of God is real, but God's sealed servants are going to stand strong. So who are these sealed servants in chapter 7? Well, verses 5 to 8 talk about this 144,000 sealed from every tribe of Israel. And remember in Revelation, we don't take any number necessarily, specifically, because it could be a symbol. And I love this quote by Matthew Wilcox, and I'm wondering if he's British, because I love how he says, 144,000 is a suspiciously tidy sort of number. <laughs> it's much more likely to be a symbol than a statistic. 144,000 is 12 to the second power times 1,000. Maybe it's the Hebrew way of saying a big number, right? It's a numberless number. Kind of like when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Remember, Jesus answered, 70 times 7. Now, did he actually mean 400 or whatever, 70 times 7? No, it was, it was meant a lot, more than you think. So does he mean that these 144,000 are ethnic Jews only? Many think they are, but some think that the 144,000 could represent the church. And if they are a symbol of the church, then the church definitely is in the great tribulation, but sealed for survival through it. So that day of judgment has come, but God is holding it back. The four winds, the four destructive agents, 
the four horsemen so Jesus can seal the believers. Then he saw the multitudes. And I love this picture. I don't know if it's going to be clear or not of the multitudes. I just thought that was so cool. <laughs> After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes, peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And the diversity spoken here is evidence that the Great Commission will be fulfilled before the coming of the end, as Jesus promised, as we talked about last week. Those unreached people groups are going to be in this multitude. And Matthew 24, 14 says, and the good news, this is Jesus' words. He said, the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. So let's get sharing that gospel, people. <laughs> Bring that in. Verses 11 and 12, the great multitude worshiping God causes the others in heaven. They're just compelled to join in praise. The angels, the four creatures, and what do they do? What do the elders do? They fall down. That's what the elders do. They fall down and they worship God with another sevenfold blessing, seven words of blessing that he's worthy of our complete praise and glory. This next part was a little strange, wasn't it? It's almost like the angel knew that John wanted to ask a question, so he just went ahead and asked it for him. Verse 13, one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the lamb. How can washing in blood make something white? And that wonderful verse, though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Believers saved out of the time of great suffering. So these great multitude of people, they knew that the wrath of God was real because they lived through it. But God's sealed servants had, are standing strong. So the last few verses of chapter 7 I love it because it talks about what the multitudes do in heaven. And in, in 2015, we lost my dad. And in the days after that, I actually memorized this whole passage because now someone so precious to me was actually in heaven. I'm like, what is he doing? You know, what are they doing in heaven? Let's read it. Verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So let's look at this. What do believers do? Well, first of all, in heaven, they live before the presence of God. In heaven, the redeemed enjoy the immediate presence of God. They come right into the throne room and they're with him. No barriers, no waiting lists. They worship with song and they declare God's salvation. Number two, they serve him day and night. You know, heaven isn't just a place of rest from earthly toil, but also a place of privileged service. And I love talking to my husband about this because he thinks he's going to be building creative things and designing buildings. I wonder if I'm going to be a heavenly cook just with all these amazing spices creating. You know, we don't know what our service in heaven will be, but it won't be boring. I can tell you that. Number three, we're going to rest in God's sheltering protection. The NASB translates verse 15 that it says, He who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. The Aramaic actually says, The enthroned one leans over them. 
Can't you just picture that? God spreading his temple, his tabernacle, just the, just the edge. Just come on over here, just protecting us. This redeemed, we're going to know the loving care and nurture of the Savior. And he's going to protect us from every affliction. Number four, they find complete satisfaction in the Lamb. There's no thirst. There's no hunger. There's no heat. Number five, they follow shepherd Jesus to springs of life. The lamb himself becomes a shepherd. Isn't that kind of a, a, a little mind bender? The lamb is the shepherd. And he leads them to those springs of living water. And when I think of a hot hike, although it won't be hot in heaven, but when I think of getting to a spring, I drink it, but I also jump in. I wonder if we're going to swim in those springs of living water. Number six, they look to Jesus to comfort and wipe away every tear. What tender love. It, it almost makes me think of a mother's loving hand brushing away the tears from her child's face. God loves us with that kind of nurturing care. So we've been talking today about how God's sealed servants stand strong. And how do we do this? How do we stand strong? By doing the same things the worshipers in heaven are doing. We're going to get warmed up for heaven. So our challenge today is how can we follow the example of the multitudes before the throne? How can we start? How can we get ready for our eternal life in heaven? Well, number one, we live before the presence of God. We spend daily time with him, worshiping, declaring his greatness. We serve him day and night. You know, you might think that you're serving your boss or you're serving your family, but you can serve the living God. When you clean that house or cook another meal or work at a job, you can do it with all your heart for God's glory as an act of worship and service to him. We can rest in God's sheltering protection. That's what we're talking about. We can remember that he who's on the throne is spreading his tabernacle over us. God's watching over us and has us in his hand. Number four, we can find our complete satisfaction in the lamb. We take every thirst, every hunger, we take our angst, we lay it before him and we look to him to satisfy. Not Netflix, not a bag of donuts, we don't, we don't look to anything to satisfy. We look to him. He is so ready to come and fill us with his Holy Spirit and satisfy those needs. Number five, we follow the shepherd Jesus to springs of life. We learn to hear the voice of our shepherd. We start to know what it sounds like. And we follow him throughout our days. And we obey what he tells us. Number six, we look to Jesus to comfort and wipe away every tear. We might still have tears here today. Yes. But we have a great hope of eternity where one day the Lamb is going to guide us. He's going to be our shepherd and he will guide us to those springs of living water and wipe away every tear from our eye. So let's get warmed up. Let's get ready for what we're going to be doing for eternity. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this beautiful picture of these saints before your throne, Lord. Inspire us as we strive to follow you, to not give in to fear, to remember that you're in control, to rest in the fact that we are sealed and nothing can separate us from you. And we can live as people of hope in a hopeless world. We can share that hope, that light with everyone around us and see even more people gathered by that throne through our lives. God, we want that. We want our lives to be a part of bringing more of that multitude to your heavenly throne, God. Would you work in us in such a powerful way that people just can't deny the hope and joy and peace that we have in you. We give you all the glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.